the skills necessary to exercise uh, the responsibilities and the rights uh, of citizenship, including participation in the court system. Well, I mean, so speaking of that, I was I was wondering, um, you you face some uh, challenges in the 1990s uh, with so many of these judges retiring. Uh, it seemed a flurry of judges retiring, and I was wondering, you know, how how did you handle that, especially with so many citizens, so many legislators not knowing or understanding the court system? Well, I was thinking back over it. Uh, generally, we would have probably 10 percent, it's amazing to think about this, but it's uh, about 10 percent of the judicial workforce probably turned over or close to that in any given year between retirements and uh, promotions or movement to another court or something like that. We had a pre-bench orientation program. For three weeks, we'd bring all new judges in, and we would generally always have 25, 30, sometimes as many as 40 or so people in those programs every year. So, and I now I've been gone five years, and I look back, and it's truly amazing to me. I mean, I knew personally every judge in the state, 400 judges, before I left, and I bet you today, after five years, I bet you there's at least 50 percent of the people that I've never heard of and don't know who they are. So. It's truly amazing that without anything unusual going on, just through the normal course of events and normal life, uh, that there is a, a lot of turnover. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about it is that that's an issue that is uh, primarily for the legislature. Uh, it's not like in a business where we would sit down and say, we're going to work on succession planning and make sure that, you know, we are proposed to to have people who can come along and fill these positions. That's just not the way that works. On the administrative side, within our office or within the clerk's offices and so forth, you think about that. It's hard to do, but you think about that. When it comes to jet ships, you basically are proceeding on the basis of if you get a vacancy, someone's going to fill it, and we're going to deal with whomever it is comes to fill it. And so what you do is, obviously, you put in as much training, that's why we talked about those pre-bench programs. We had a very, I think, good uh, continuing legal education or judicial education programs, uh, two conferences a year for each type of judge. So our, our thrust of this was to get the people early, uh, get them familiar with the administrative side. Basically, you leave up to them and hope they bring the legal skills and the things that they have to do to know the law and to know that aspect of it. And what we were trying to do is to give them some of those, some of the other skills, the management, the administrative skills, and also some things that probably many judges don't think about. One of, the, one of our favorite things, that my favorite things, probably not their favorite thing, but that we used to do during our previous thing was that we would always videotape judges in the trial of a case and then play that back to them and have it critiqued. And we had it critiqued over the years. First, we had a psychiatrist that did it, and then we had communication specialists and so forth. But generally trying to talk about uh, nonverbal communications and how body language and gestures like I'm doing here, how, how all those things say so much, so much more than the words. I mean, one of the studies done in, uh, at UCLA said that only 7% of any communication has to do with the words. The other 90%, 93% have to do basically with tone of voice and body language. And uh, so most judges are not thinking about that, and many times uh, complaints that were filed against judges, and we of course had a Judicial Inquiry and Review Commission that investigates complaints against judges, and often the, the complaints that were uh, filed that were legitimate, many were not legitimate, but had to do with someone just making a, an offhand uh, humorous remark and just not thinking about it or even saying something that was not intended in any way in a bad way, but through their tone or body language was offensive or demeaning uh, to people. So, and, and that's going to happen uh, in any communication, that's going to happen. But what, what, if you're in the business of doing that, and that's what a judge is, you've got to be more conscious, more aware. And so we spent an awful lot of time trying to make them uh, aware of uh, how they were seen by others. Let me ask you then, um, did you see a change from the 1970s until the time you retired? Um, did you see a change in the numbers of turnover 
of judges, or or was this um, this was typical? Uh, uh, pro rata, I would say it was typical, and by that I mean obviously we increased the number of judges overall as we went, so you would normally expect there to be a greater number of turnover, but percentage-wise I would say, I, I, I obviously hadn't looked back to give you the specifics, but I, I did not perceive that to be any, any greater change. As I said, I think uh, it's so much a function of okay, how young were they when they came on the bench. Uh, sometimes you had judges who, come on, who would come on bench young, but most of the time you had judges who would come on 45 or 50 years old. So you're not expecting uh, people who come on at mid or late career to stay uh, for a really long period of time. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that there was much change in that over the years, at least from my just intuitive reaction to it. Let me um, shift gears just a little bit and ask you, um, uh, about the the retirement of Justice Carrico and the um, and the new com incoming uh, new justice new Chief Justice excuse me Leroy Hassell and what that transition was like since you had worked for you know for right. so many years with Chief Justice Carrico. Well, it, it was uh, I think the transition between them where it was extremely smooth. Uh, as I said, Chief Justice Carrico stayed as a senior justice. So he was around to provide uh, vice and support and guidance uh, as needed to Chief Justice Assel. And of course, the fact that I'd been there a long time, uh, I had that same opportunity to, to provide that. And so I think, uh, from my perspective, and I don't know if he would say this is true, but from my perspective, I think he took that first uh, good part of the first year or so to uh, sort of get the lay of the land and to, to learn and to, to uh, appreciate uh, what the history and what the past was about. And of course, it certainly was a help that he had been on the court for X number of years, whatever, 10 or more years probably. So it's not like somebody is stepping in from the outside. Uh, he brought to it a different approach than Chief Justice Carrico did, going back maybe to some of the comments that I had earlier about Younger and people coming along after these administrative issues are there. I, I think his approach was far more hands-on, uh, far more operational, far more interested in uh, being actively involved in, in all of the uh, decisions and in all of the even operations. One of the things that uh, I would have characterized, and again, I don't know if Chief Justice Carrico would have characterized it this way or not, but I always characterized the, the relationship and the model that we had, and I think one that exists in, not in all states, but in a number of states is that under him, I, I would say that he was the chairman of the board, if you want to draw an analogy to a private sector company, and I was the chief executive officer uh, of the company. So it was my job to bring forth ideas, his job as chair of the board, and the board being either the Supreme Court or the Judicial Council say yes to those ideas, and then my job to carry those ideas out. Uh, I think with uh, Chief Justice Assell, Chief Justice Assell, uh, function a little bit more like both a uh, chairman of the board and a CEO. In other words, I, I think he was much more uh, active and, and hands-on. He liked that. Uh, he was much more interested in uh, legislative matters and getting involved with uh, legislators. I think he had a lot of good relationships uh, that pre-existed his coming on as chief, and so uh, he, he wanted to take advantage of those things. So. It was a it was a different model is what I would say it was a it was a totally different model. Obviously, both are both can and have been and are successful, uh, but uh, and, and there's no good or bad or right or wrong. But it's just two different approaches, two different models. Well, now that shift then in in the way in which the chief justice saw his position and his job and duties uh, required um, considerable adjustment for you because you've been. Uh, m more accustomed to reaching out to the legislators and so right. forth. So tell me a little bit about that. That uh, well, uh, again, obviously that was only true for, since that only lasted. Two, I was only there two more years after he came, so it was it was a it was a major difference, but it was relatively uh, short uh, uh, lived. It, it's like any anything else. You try to figure out what the rules of the game are, and then. You, particularly somebody like me, I am a rule follower, and so uh, you follow the rules. And so 
while it was different, when I and I don't know for sure that I understood the difference to start off with, I say what I say now in hindsight, but while it was different, uh, as soon as I understood what was different and what was expected, then I accommodated that and dealt with it and you know acted accordingly. Uh, now that was that was something that made the job less uh, attractive to me, uh, but at the same time, uh, it was still my job was to do what what he believed to be the right way to have that role in the relationship uh, exist, and and, I, and that's what I did, uh, you know, to the best of my ability. How was the job less attractive? Well, it was just that I was more being, I, I became more of a chief operating officer than a chief executive officer. So if you've been the chief executive officer for 30 years or 28 years or whatever, and then you become a, a more operational and major person, then it's, it's a slightly less, uh, lesser uh, level of a job, I guess you'd say. Still, there are many great things going on and plenty to keep you busy, so there, there's no issue there. But it was just that the, the, the level and functionality of the job was, was different. And so when you, um, uh, how long did it take before you recognized that there was a, 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 a very definite shift in the, the, in the way in which the Chief Justice expected you to do your job? Well, I, I think at some level I probably knew that coming in, uh, and I think probably most any uh, person who would have come along at this point in time again, uh, being new, being younger, having experienced all the transition that had already occurred, probably would have come with that newer approach. So at some level I probably saw that coming even before we started. But it was probably, uh, before I internalized that and understood it probably fully, again I would probably say more six months or maybe even up to a year. But that's what I was saying earlier. I think Chief Justice Sell did a good thing of coming in and spending a little time getting sort of, uh, and again, I don't know if he would say this, but I, I saw it as getting to, to know the environment, learning from Chief Justice Carrico, listening to what I had to say, and then after you know six months or whatever, some period of time, I think he felt, okay, now I've got this, and now I'm ready to take hold and lead and go. And that's when I think he started to assert uh, his influence uh, uh, far more. So did you find yourself going up to the fourth floor less? Actually, I did go less. Uh, and But it, it, the, probably the reason for that was that he was a little more formal in approach there and, and uh, you know, would rather do things by uh, have a time and let's have a meeting and schedule. Because he was on the move a lot more. He was. Uh, going out. Chief Justice Carrico was there most all the time, you know, during the day and was available, but Chief Justice Sell had uh, lots of meetings, external and legislative and otherwise, and so he was much more hectic a schedule, and so I can understand that, but I think he, what he looked for was, uh, okay, let's, if we got to talk about something, okay, let's, let's set up a time and we'll meet at 3 o'clock today and talk about it. So that, just that different shift or different model there led to fewer, you know, fewer meetings. But certainly I never had any hesitancy about going to when I needed to, even if it wasn't a, a scheduled time. Mm -hmm. um, now, you said that you worked um, under him for two years. And um, at what point did you decide to retire from that position and move to the one that you currently occupy? Well, uh, probably, uh, again, uh, I think I ultimately, I was trying to remember when, when this actually was, but I think I announced my retirement. I retired on uh, April 1st, 2005, and I want to say it was in the fall, the previous fall, so uh, about a year and a half or so, uh, I guess I would say, into it, or, or uh, sometime in the fall of 2004, I guess, is, is my best memory of that. And what made you decide to retire? Well, I think it was just in, in the best interest of, of the, the court and, and, and uh, of my uh, professional life, too, because uh, I'd been there a long time. I think there was probably uh, an interest in having new blood, new leadership, uh, and when we had energetic new leadership in Chief Justice Assel. So it probably was one of those things where you, when you take a look at it from everybody's perspective, it was a good time uh, you know, for me to, to move on. 
Now, w when you made the decision to retire, did you already have in mind uh, your new career? Well, I knew I wasn't going to retire, retire. Uh, uh, as my wife likes to say, I, I retired for three days, and, and uh, that was only because I had to do the taxes during those three days, and, and then I went to the work at the center. But I, I, was, uh, I was pursuing uh, other opportunities. I can't say that I had formalized the, the job that I hold now when I uh, announced my retirement, but I, I was looking at other opportunities at, at that time. I, I am a person without hobbies and things, and so I, I don't want to, uh, I, I can't really stand a three-day weekend because I, uh, I get out of things to do, and I always have to be on the move. So I needed to, uh, I needed to work and to, uh, uh, to, to be active and stay active. So I was looking for something. And the, the National Center for State Courts, where I ultimately uh, went, offered a, a really nice thing from the point of view. It was very, very similar to what I'd been doing, except it was on a national level versus a state level. Uh, now, it wasn't as operational. I mean, when, in my old job, we were doing operational things, you know, determining the number of people in courts and working on forms and working on automated systems and making the courts run. So it wasn't operational like that, but it was working on the same issues, the improvement of the court system. Uh, so it was a, a very nice uh, transition, I guess you say, to be able to say, to do something new and different, yet something that's in the same genre that you've been doing and one of the things that amazed me, I will say, after I made the switch, was that how energizing it actually was to do something different. And I, you know, I've done the same thing for almost 31 years. And while I, I still think every day was different, it was exciting, and it was, and it was challenging. It was within the same context, and I didn't appreciate it then, but doing even many of those same things just in a different environment, a different arena, a different context caused it to be so much more energizing. And I, and I use that term energizing because, you know, when I came to work, if you've been doing something for 30 years, when you come to work, you will have many challenging things to do, but you will generally think you will know how to deal with all those things that, that come to you during the day because you've done them all before. And when you go to something new, you know, it is possible today that, you know, things are going to happen that you don't know how to deal with or you haven't dealt with before. And so that gets you on your toes, you know, a little bit more. So, And one of the things that I said to the, the people where I am now, I had the beauty of in my old job, not only having been there for 30 years, but having been there from ground zero. So everything literally that had happened happened since I was there. So I had all the institutional knowledge and all the understanding of how all that worked together and all the uh, things that happened to get something to happen politically and otherwise. And then you go to a job and you have no institutional knowledge. Now I went to a place that I thought I knew a lot about because it was an organization that I was the constituent of in essence in my old job. So, and it was here, it was located here in Virginia, so I, I'm sure I knew as much about that as anybody in my, that a similar job around the country. But still, when I got there, I realized I really didn't know anything about it. And I, I could not always rely upon institutional knowledge to solve a problem. It's so great when someone brings you a problem, if you're able to take five pieces of information that occurred 5, 10, 15 years ago and pull them all together and say, well, based on that, I think we ought to do this. And then if you go to a job where you have nothing to do that with, and not only that, what you have to do, it takes a lot longer, too, because what you have to do in this new arena is you have to go back and do research. Not only do you not have this institution of knowledge, but you now, to make the simplest of little decisions, You've got to go read this, read that, read this. So a decision that might have taken me 30 seconds in my old job might take me three days in my new job just familiarizing myself with all the background that I think was necessary to, in fact, make a good decision. So all of those things 
were challenging but energizing uh, in a way. And how long did it take before you uh, acquired that institutional knowledge? I, I'm not there yet, uh, but uh, certainly not anything like it was in before. But it was probably, and I, I probably am ashamed to even say this, but it, it was probably a couple of years before I felt comfortable. I, I will go along with comfortable now. I won't go along with saying I, I have uh, any type of institutional knowledge. I, I have some. But I did, after a couple of years, get to a sense that I thought what was going to happen today would be stuff that uh, you know, I was sort of familiar with and, and comfortable with. So some people might have gotten that a little bit faster, but you know, it, it took me a while to get to that level of, uh, of comfort. Well, now, logistically, um, the, the National Center for State Courts is located in Williamsburg, and you continue to live in Richmond, requiring about an hour drive each way. Um, and so that hour um, was something new for you. Yes. Uh, and so I was wondering, how did that impact uh, perhaps how you thought, um, how maybe you reflected on things, uh, your energy level, because two hours a day driving can be difficult, can be grueling. Um, so well, it is the biggest drawback uh, of the job. Uh, it's actually, to, to, to put a fine point on it, an hour and 11 minutes <laughs> each way. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's interesting because uh, when I started, uh, I had all these great ideas as to how I was going to solve this problem. And actually, one of, one of my uh, retirement gifts that, it, that my office my office did just an unbelievable number of nice things uh, during my retirement time. But one of them was one of the uh, satellite radios and so forth. So, uh, and they gave that to me, I think, expecting, although I hadn't announced what I was going to do, but they gave that to me thinking that I was going to do something with the National Center. So that was my first thought that I was going to you know, listen to all these radios. Well, you know, that was okay for a while. Then... Uh, books on tape, I was going to go to books on tape, and I did that for a while. Then I was going to learn how to speak Spanish, even though I took Spanish a couple years in college, I don't know how to speak it, so I was going to learn how to speak Spanish. So I've been through the whole gamut, and I sort of run through those on a regular cycle. But the bottom line uh, is at the end of the day, it is two and a half hours almost of wasted time. I also thought that I knew I'd never be able to do any business on, in the morning, but I did think that because in the afternoon the West Coast would still be open, that I might be able to do business, you know, call people and do those types of things. It, it hasn't worked out that way. I, I guess I could do that, but in all honesty, you know, if you work for nine or ten hours, then it's sort of not as high a priority to, to do that. So what it is, what it has transpired is that I haven't minded it too much because uh, the traffic is not bad. Uh, I, I generally before and after the traffic, and so except when there's an accident, the traffic's not too bad. Uh, and the other thing is, it does provide you, particularly in the afternoon, it does provide you a little bit of downtime, so that when you, when I do get home, uh, then you are a little bit better able to. Uh, you know, participate in life. I, I, unfortunately, my father is, is in a nursing home and has Alzheimer's, and my mother did for a time before that. So for a long time, I, I have to I go by and see them on the way home each night. So it does make for a long day, and it does make, mean that I get home uh, late. But it, it is a wind-down type of thing. And in the morning, uh, I, you know, I, I can't say I use it very productively. And so that's my biggest thing because I, I do think about things in terms of you know, lists, doing things, checking things off, accomplishing things. And for those two hours and a half, it's no, not much get accomplished, gets accomplished. I was wondering, um, after you retired, um, and it sounds as if you, you did have time to reflect on the different things that you did um, since 1975, really. Um, what would you have done perhaps differently, and what are you most proud of? Well, I guess I, what I'm most proud of is the fact, I guess I would say, of the body of work. 
because uh, there are three or four things, and I've mentioned a couple of those things that I think were, were highlight things. I think implementing technology, I think the Court of Appeals, I think bringing in mediation, I think the Futures Commission was groundbreaking work. There's some things that, you know, when you think about it, stand out in your mind. But I, I think what I'm really proud of is the fact that we did start at relatively non-existence as far as a state function of, of courts. And what's there today was based on the work that's done. And I think it was done well. I think it was done in a first-class fashion. And I think it was done in such a way that the public has a good feeling about the courts in Virginia. And they probably, the public doesn't know I ever existed or that the administrative office of the courts ever existed. But I, I think without those things, that might not be as true. So I, I think that the thing that I'm most proud of is that we did an awful lot of things, that we did an unbelievably good job of building a foundation upon which the courts can go forward now and, and do even far, far greater things. And we did that in a, in a way that was uh, never uh, bureaucratic. It was never uh, anything other than with the highest sense of integrity and it was with the best interest of the courts and the people in the state at heart. And I say that with every ounce of sincerity that I can muster. Uh, on the other side of the issue, and I may have already mentioned this, there, when we talk about things done differently, I don't know, uh, I, surely in any given moment or situation you would do something differently. But as a total, I don't know what I would say I would do differently, but I would say that there were three or four things, three things I can think of, I think right off the bat, that were big disappointments. So hopefully I would have done something differently to make these succeed. But the, the first is that we never were able to implement uh, merit selection of judges. Uh, it's one of the things that we worked on year after year after year, literally introduced legislation probably every year I was there, uh, and we never were successful. Uh, what we have, the method of selection we have, is far better in my judgment than a popular election of judges, which is the predominant means in the state courts around the country. Uh, but what we thought was, we never had a sense that we could change from getting the legislature to elect judges because going and asking them to give up patronage that they would have would be impossible. So we thought that creating a judicial nominations commission where you would have an independent nonpartisan group investigate the, the uh, qualifications of, of people and certify them to be qualified or not would be a way of getting politics out of it and ensuring that you were getting people on the basis of merit. And we were never successful in doing that. So that was a big failure and a, and a big disappointment. Uh, interesting enough, it was, this is partly humorous, uh, is that it's sort of in the middle of when I was there was when you had a big shift of from it started out as the state was a one party state Democrats and then it, in the middle of the time that I was there it shifted to with the Republicans taking control and the interesting thing when the Democrats were in charge and they were the sole party running things all the Republicans were very much in favor of our bill of judicial nominations commission and merit selection and then when the Republicans came into power, they were opposed and all the Democrats were in favor. <laughs> and so it's whoever was on in the minority was on our side, which meant we were always in the minority. <laughs> and so we always lost. Uh, so that was uh, a very disappointing thing. I've already talked about the family court. Uh, that was not, uh, that was a big disappointment because I, I think the impact of that, the impact of electing judges would have had a, a multiplying and a rippling effect throughout, I think, the, the quality of, of the bench. Not that I said we had a great quality, we had a very high quality, but perception is everything. And, and if you have people who believe that the selection process is such that it's not political, it's not backroom, then the confidence they have in decisions and the support they have for the system is just so much better. So that would have been great. Then the family court would have been specifically good for a group of people, the children and, and people who are in trauma in families. 
And that would have been, uh, you know, so good. And, and we weren't successful there. And we were so close there. I mean, we actually passed the legislation. And I never will forget, again, another co a compliment that I uh, always remember. There was a fella uh, who was a part of the, I don't remember, uh, Interfaith Council or something. There was a church-related organization that came up after we lost on the, uh, on the family court. And he said, well, some people's failures are infinitely better than other people's successes. And I always took that as a compliment, and I always used it at least to, to, to sort of soothe my feelings, because we had failed there, but the fact that we tried and the fact that we were doing what I think was the really right thing to do was very satisfying. Uh, and that was another thing that was good about the whole time that I was there. Uh, uh, the ability to, to make a difference and the ability to do things in the way that you think they need to be done and in a way that is, is taking the high ground. Uh, and sometimes I think we lost on things because we took the high grounds. I think, I, I used to say that we're being asked to play in a political arena when it talks, when we talk about something that is, has to do with changing legislation. We were being asked to play in a political arena but not play by the rules because we couldn't, obviously we couldn't get anybody to give any money to, to people's campaigns and things like that. So, and I always use the example, I always said, well, this is like tying my hands behind my back and sending me in the ring to fight Muhammad Ali and expecting to win because you're playing by a totally different set of rules. And so I think we suffered some of the things we did, but I wouldn't change that. It, going back to your original question, I wouldn't change and play by any different set of rules, uh, even if it meant succeeding, because sometimes the you know the end is just those those means are not worth the, or the end's not worth those means. Um, oh, the other thing that was a, a big disappointment, and and this was early on, so I got over this probably, but was the thing I mentioned previously about uh, from a management point of view, it would make so much more sense to have the circuit court clerks not be elected officials and to be appointed by the chief judges. Uh, so uh, that was, again, a political. All, all the three things that we failed at were political issues. They were, and not just political issues, big time political issues, ensconced in tradition of history, of years and years of Virginia history. So the chances of us succeeding probably were never great. Then you add to that that we were playing by a different set of rules and a different standard than others uh, had. The outcome was probably foregone. Uh, but if you look at those three things, they're all in different areas. One's in a management arena that could have made things management-wise so much better. One's in a service to people, children and families that could have made things so much better. And the other is in just the ultimate decision and dispute resolution function for the whole system. Could have been made a lot better. Uh, now again, by saying that could, all of those things could make things a lot better, that's true. But it does not mean that what we have now is not good. And that actually was one of the reasons that we never, one of the additional reasons that we could never succeed in getting the merit selection through, because you didn't have a scandal. You, you didn't have the ability to say it's lousy. And, you know, to go in and say, okay, we want to change something, generally you say, well, this is wrong, this is bad, this, we've got to fix this, this is just awful. You, what we were put in the position of, we were going and saying, we're great, this is good, we have been the best in the world, and by the way, we want to change it. And so that, you know, that argument just didn't, didn't play or sell very well. So we have a good, solid system, but it's just when you see things that can be improved that in such fundamental ways that you want to do that. So uh, I would have loved to have seen those things done, uh, but again, I'm not sure uh, for most of them that there's much differently. Maybe we would have tried to get in the family court that first year without going back in to, on the two year, the second year, because it, it actually probably would have passed and it would be in existence today if we had done it that way. Well, my final question to you is, uh, and this is a tough one, what do you want to be remembered most by when you were serving as, of course, the director of the office of the executive secretary? Well, uh, I, 
uh, as I said earlier, I, I'll start talking, and sooner or later, maybe I'll get around to answering your question. Uh, one of the things that I found early on, or I learned early on, was that if you're going to take the lead in doing something, that you cannot always please everybody, and you cannot always have everybody like you. Uh, and so what I tried to do was I tried to not concentrate on that, but to concentrate on something that I could control. And so the things that I thought I could control, I guess I would have to say those are the things that I would like to be remembered by. And what that is is I think that I always worked as hard as I possibly could work. I, I, I was involved in sports, and so I always use the expression, I left it all between the lines, uh, meaning that you know, when you're in a game, you're generally in on a lined off field or court, and if you do everything you can so that when you walk away, you say, every ounce I had was left out there between those lines, I did that. And then the second thing is that I did that with, I think, total integrity, and I, I believe that everybody would say that. And by that I mean that I never took an action that was in my own best interest, and that every action I ever took was in my judgment, and others would have had different judgment probably, but in my judgment was in the best interest of the court system of, of this state. Uh, and so, and then the other thing I would say is that I always try to treat other people as I would like to be treated. Now, as a humorous aside to that, one of the things I found out about the ESTJ, which I am on the Myers-Briggs, somebody said, well, yeah, it's one thing to say that you uh, treat others like you'd like to be treated, but sometimes people say no one else would like to be treated like an ESTJ would like to be treated. <laughs> So I'm not sure that's a good thing or bad. But anyway, uh, I, I, I did literally try. I never asked anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do uh, as far as a management style. And, I mean, not that I wanted to, but I never asked them to do anything that I wouldn't do. I always tried to lead by doing. And so I, I, I just tried to, uh, you know, give it all I had and to treat other people like uh, I would like to be treated. And so I would hope that people would remember me for those personal traits. All the things that were done, I'm very proud of, but as I think I said earlier, there's nothing that ever happens, probably in anything, but certainly not in government. That's the total responsibility or total credit of, of one person. So everything that's happened in this system over all these years was uh, the product of the work of, of dozens of people. I was proud to be a leader in that and a part of all of that, but it was a part of a joint and team effort by, by everybody. So I, I take great pride in those things that we as a team accomplished, but I take greater pride, I guess, in those personal traits that I brought to it. And uh, as I think I remember saying at my retirement party that that brings you to the point where you know you basically can can say that you've fought a good fight, you've finished the course, and you've kept the faith. And I thought I did that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure.